Okay, hey guys, uh, this is Dr. Chafee. I um, just wanted to do a quick uh, video just, just going over some of the points that was made in the recent carnivore versus vegan debate that was held by uh, Actum and just do a bit of a, of a rebuttal on some of the points that the uh, vegan team made um, just because we didn't have a bit uh, as much of a back and forth um, during the, the debate itself. So I just wanted to address some of the points that they had as well and sort of go through them live and then sort of you know stop and start and uh, talk about things as we go okay uh, also just want to say you know I had a really nice time with this time anyway every, everybody involved you know you know whether or not we agree or disagree everyone you know was coming from a very honest place you know they they you know my impression was that, that everybody you know truly wanted uh, what was right for people they wanted to sort of figure out the truth and, and what was the best way to help people and I think that's the best way of doing things and, and it's very important for uh, like-minded people in that in that regard uh, to, to come together and, and have these sorts of discussions and I think that it went uh, very well from that standpoint and uh, everything was very uh, you know collegial which is which is the way to do it I mean you have to have these sorts of discussions and debates so that you know people can hash out their ideas and, and, and bounce them off other people that have an opposing view and and see what comes up so uh, I think that that went well from that standpoint and I just wanted to to go through uh, some of those so we'll start here with uh, uh, first uh, gentleman just who's from an amazing gastroenterologist. There we go. let's now hear from Jason Kaplan a phenomenal cardiologist yeah, so Dr. Kaplan's a cardiologist. Go on, Jason uh, good evening everyone and thank you for joining and thank you Pran for opening up opening up the debate I want to start off to think about why we choose a dietary pattern. We either choose it to live longer or to prevent disease. And Pran gave some very interesting arguments, but nowhere did I hear about anything about the carnivore diet preventing the most common diseases of, of Western society or, or prolonging life. The major diseases in our society a quick one on that so obviously there there aren't you know robust studies that have, have specifically exclusively looked at the carnivore diet and you know what that's going to do long term these are these are starting to come out now harvard just pu published a study um there was another study that just came out you know just a couple of days ago as well and this is this is going to sort of get the ball rolling on those sorts of things so hopefully we will get that sort of thing the the point that people in the meat is good or carnivore camp uh are coming from or are making is that you know there is there is data and there is information that you know it is very clear that the the thoughts and and um, uh, you know notions that we've had for for decades now are actually not true. And so you know when you have a, a you know sort of a, you know something based on a false pretense predicated on information that we now know is false. Um, or we have new information that now shows that it's not that it's not accurate. You, you have to sort of throw those those assumptions out and you have to start over again okay and that's and that's a lot of what these arguments are from they're, they're quite robust actually so you know just not having you know a specific say oh where's your rct that shows exactly what carnivore does well they're coming but there's there's evidence that exists outside of that and a big part of that evidence is showing that your evidence uh isn't actually accurate okay that's the sign you relate to cardiovascular disease, cardiometabolic disease, and, and cancer. And vegan and mostly plant-based diets are the only dietary patterns that are able to achieve these goals. When we think about choosing a dietary pattern for our health... Just, just a quick one there again. You know, I, I addressed this in, in you know, my, my part of the debate, and I went further on my, my larger discussion on my arguments. What what is a vegan diet? Vegan just means not meat. So the only thing that makes a vegan diet is not meat. So you know any vegan diet. So just eat Oreo cookies and shoot heroin. That that's okay. That that's going to reduce your cancer rate. That's going to be better than eating a steak. Really, you know probably not. So you know when when you're talking about a vegan diet, like what does that even mean? You know generally when people go vegan, they're being very health conscious. They're thinking about this. They're not eating processed foods. They're not going out to meals. They're not eating drinking sodas. They're not eating things with a bunch of added sugar and so forth. You're, you're cutting out a lot of things that that actually cause harm and we know cause harm. And so of course you're going to get better if you were eating those things before. And so you know that's not a that's not a controlled experiment. A controlled experiment means you change one variable and you look at this group that hasn't changed anything. You change one variable and then you look at this group. That's what a controlled 
uh, trial looks at. That's not what's going on here with the vegan community. They're not just changing one thing. They're changing dozens of things. And then they're saying, oh, wow, you know, but because we call it vegan, vegan means no meat. That's what it is. Well, no, I'm sorry. You know, if you if you stop eating meat and you just eat a bunch of Oreo cookies and you're drinking alcohol and smoking cigarettes, all plant based, you are not going to be doing well. I'm sorry. So they're doing a lot of other things. The people that have benefits are doing a lot of other things because a lot of people don't. A lot of people do eat a bunch of crap because they think that, well, it's vegan, therefore it's good for me. No, of course it's not. Health and well-being. We have to think about outcome benefits. The first thing we do is do, is do no harm. And I have seen plenty of harm done by people eating a predominantly carnivore diet, especially with, with underlying, underlying heart disease. And then we have to think about choosing a dietary pattern that is evidence for outcomes and reduced disease rates. When we recommend this for our patients and ourselves and for the people around us, this is what we need to look for. And the evidence needs to be consistent for the food patterns and individual foods within that particular particular patterns. And that can only be set for, for a vegan diet. As a preventative cardiologist, I've been on a 10-year journey to recommend sustainable dietary pattern that will allow patients to have a reduced disease rate and reduced reliance on, on medications to treat cardio cardiovascular vascular disease. And it's no surprise to see that the ex-president of the American College of Cardiology, Kim Williams, after his first heart attack, decided to become vegan. You know, and also other wonderful preventative cardi cardiologists such as Robert Vogel, team doctor to the NFL, and, and, and Dean Ornish. Throughout this debate, I would urge... Okay, so that's appealing to authority, first of all, just because some, some expert or something somewhere says this is the right way to go doesn't actually mean that it is. Hitler was an expert. Hitler was an authority. Do we just do everything that he said because, you know, he's an authority? No, of course not. You know, that's nice that, you know, people are, are going this, that they feel that they're an expert and they feel that that's the right thing for them to do, but it doesn't actually prove anything, you know? Um, and again, what vegan diet? What vegan diet is he, is he talking about? Does he just say, yeah, just eat Oreo cookies and, you know, um, you know, and, and a bunch of pasta and drink soda? That's all vegan. You know, Oreo cookies are vegan, okay? So, you know, I'm positive that he is not having people do that when they go on to a vegan diet, and, and I'm sure he doesn't recommend that either. So there's, there's this conflation where you're saying you go on to a vegan diet and everything gets better. And I'm sure he's having, you know, very good results, you know, and, and he's obviously someone who cares about his patients and obviously someone who's trying to do the best for them. And, and I'm sure that the diets and things like that that he's putting forward are helping them. Where are they starting? Where are they ending up? They're probably eating a whole bunch of processed crap with a bunch of sugar and carbohydrates and other nonsense. And then he's getting them off all of that crap and putting them on like a whole food, vegan, sort of plant-based, whatever. And at the same time, he's saying, oh, and, and reduce the amount of fat and, uh, you know, saturated fat, animal fat, and uh, animal products that you have, you know. But he, he's going to be changing a lot of things as well okay and you know, we have we have so much evidence to show that that cholesterol doesn't actually cause heart disease that's not the problem here there's an inflammatory process and you know it actually has to do with well, hyper, you know um you know hyperglycemia and you know um different kinds of cholesterol molecules like vldl and hdl or sorry vldl and sdldl that are derived from fructose and alcohol not from meat and that these then get glycated from the high uh, blood sugar and that your, your body can't suck these things up anymore because you're just damaged now. That's what glycation is, is what kills diabetics, having that high blood sugar. And so now your body can't suck these things up. You got, but your liver can't you know, process them. The only things that can pick these up are the scavenger uh, receptors on your macrophages. And so your macrophages start picking these things up. They just eat them up, eat them up, eat them up, eat them up and up. And they grow and grow and grow. They turn into these massive foam cells. And during this whole inflammatory process, you start getting these, these atherosclerotic plaques. Okay. That's been well described in the literature. Okay. So it's not cholesterol. It's this entire disease process that is generally you know, pushed and predicated on eating sugar, eating carbohydrates, drinking alcohol, okay? Smoking cigarettes. Oh, there's a ton of things that, that add to this, you know? But just eating cholesterol is really not 
not the the driving factor here. The carnival team to produce any long term studies to show that a carnival diet produces a reduction in cut in, in, in event rates or reduction in reduction in cancer. Again, you know, we don't have those studies that show specifically a carnivore diet is going to do this. We've got a ton of evidence and, and studies showing that like ketogenic does it. We have a ton of evidence, biochemical evidence, showing that if you cut out carbohydrates, this shrinks cancers, that this actually reduces your risk of cancers and so forth by certain specific biochemical pathways um, that, that get disrupted when you eat carbohydrates, okay? At a cellular, uh, at a microcellular level, okay? Um, you know, so that's a that's a false argument. You know, it's like oh, of course we're not going to produce a long, you know, thirty year long carnivore study showing that they don't exist yet because this is a very new burgeoning argument that's actually very very old, but it's just being rediscovered now. Um, and so we, we of course we don't have have the data for that. You know, but we do have data looking at indigenous people like the Inuits and so forth, or the native Australians, where they don't, they weren't eating any, you know, plant-based products at all. They're eating very high fat diets. They weren't getting any of these problems. And they'll, they'll argue there's like, oh, well, there's these studies that actually show that, you know, the Inuits and so forth, uh, living, living wherever, actually have, you know, mixed sort of, you know, some have heart disease, some have atherosclerosis, some don't, some have diabetes, actually, you know, you, you can't just say that. Those studies, look at the Inuit people as an ethnic population, not living in their natural state as carnivores, as high fat carnivores. They're talking about, so they're including the people living in cities eating a Western diet. Well, we all know that's gonna be, the, that's gonna be a problem. We're, 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 trying to, we're not talking about the ethnic group Inuits. We're talking about their traditional diet and what does that do? And that actually shows a significant benefit of uh, in in health and um, re reduction in disease. Um, you know, I learned when I was a kid that you know Native Americans, when eating a Western diet, were four times as likely to get obesity, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and so forth. Right. And I remember thinking as a kid, well, you know, doesn't that mean that the food is causing the disease? Because if they don't eat the food, they don't get the disease. And we eat the food, and we get the disease. We just get it at a lower rate. You know, and I was thinking, well, okay, well, what, what is a non-Western diet? You know, what would they normally be eating that they're not now? And, you know, what are they eating that we're not and vice versa, right? They never really said anything. But what, you know, but the answer to that is they were, they were high-fat carnivores. You know, the Plains Indians were, were eating buffalo. They'd drive a herd off a, off a cliff. They'd have, they'd have really fatty meat and make pemmican. Look it up. It's cool. It's, it's actually really good. They, they would eat that the rest of the damn year. Okay, and you have the Inuits up north. They they're you know eating seal and and walrus and and uh, you know bear and things like that, polar bear, fish, and so forth. So, you know, then when they go onto a Western diet and, and you know drink alcohol and eat sugar and things like that as well, they get very very sick. Okay, but then if you stop eating that, it goes away. Okay, so that, that that's showing causation there. And there's a study in Australia that actually showed that as well because they you know they're, they're very, very, you know, unhealthy population, you know, as, as a whole here in Australia, the native Australians, uh, that's because they're eating, you know, Western food and they're, you know, drinking alcohol, eating sugar and, and all these sorts of things. And then someone figured out, I was like, okay, well, you know, if you, you guys won't normally eat this stuff, you know, why don't you just go back to eat what you normally do, which is meat, you know, just animals that you, you are able to hunt in the, in the wild. And then when you got them on that, it just it just reversed everything. Okay, so th this is showing causation. Okay, and there's actual studies that do show causation with like fructose and metabolic disease and and all these other sorts of things as well. So, again, you don't have that perfectly designed, you know, thirty year RCT with you know carnivore versus whatever. But there's other things that exist. You know, there's the you know where's the randomized control trial showing the parachutes work. Where's the randomized control trial showing that smoking causes cancer, or you know, after or, or you know, atherosclerosis or emphysema? You know, this is something we we just take for granted. This is this is what we're taught. This is what we, we teach, and this is what we see. But there aren't any randomized control trials showing that. Okay, so again, 
You know, there's evidence that exists outside of a randomized controlled trial, but there are carnivore studies coming as well. And I might even try to convince you to think that all the top researchers, from the top epidemiologists, and every top doctor treating cardi- cardiovascular disease and oncology would be thinking that they've got, got, got it wrong, right? That they've, that they've got it right. I want to bring you the evidence base from. Other- okay, so you know, it's just sort of obviously you're gonna to have to stop a lot here because there, there's just a lot of these things are just um, I think that they're not really robust arguments so again you know it's just like you know how dare you question all the top epidemiologists in the world and well first of all epidemiological data um, is used to to back things up that they, they don't have any business doing that when you're looking at epidemiological studies generally if it doesn't show a 200% you know increased correlation you don't even look at it as significant. All these epidemiological studies are showing like an 18% increase and so forth. You have so many confounding factors that go into these sorts of things. And in fact, when they redid all these epidemiological studies, they didn't even show a correlation between you know eating meat and bowel cancer, eating meat and heart disease, eating meat and all these sorts of things. Okay, so um, you know, and 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 again, that's appealing to authority just because you know teachers said so. That doesn't actually mean it's true. You know, all the top scientists in the world thought the earth was flat, too, at one point. How'd that one work out? Okay. And if you really want to know what the top, the top epidemiologist on earth thinks, uh, Professor John Ioannidis from Stanford, who is one of the top 10 most cited researchers of all time in any field, he said, and I quote, the Eat Lancet study is not science, it's science fiction. And that's the only way I can describe it, or paraphrase him anyway. So actually, the top epidemiologists think this is garbage. And they've shown it's garbage. You look up his work, he talks about it. Some observational studies. When we think about some of the work done in the Blue Zones by Dan Butner from Ikaria, Loma Linda, Sardinia, um, Okinawa, and Nicoya in Costa Rica, these diets of the world's longest living people are predominantly plant based. They did not eat a they did not eat a lot of red meat, and I can guarantee you they weren't in ketosis for the for, for their whole lives. Yet these are the people living living to ninety years ninety years old and, and longer and are happy and, and are lively. Um, so when you think about Okay, again, so these are very problematic studies. The Blue, Blue Zone study, they only looked at incomplete data. They didn't look at every single society. They didn't look at native populations that were eating as a carnivore. Okay, they just skipped those out. All right. Um, and, uh, you know, talking about Okinawa. Okay. Uh, Okinawa, they're saying that, oh, these people, these, these things didn't eat red meat. That's, that's, that's clever how he used that word, didn't use red meat. They eat a lot of pig. They, eat, they have pigs all over that island. Okay, they eat a lot of meat. Okay, it's just pig. It's not red meat. I'm like, oh, sorry, you know. I guess throw the whole whole argument out. Um, and uh, actually, uh, the longest lived city is um, Hong Kong. Uh, and this again, this is averages from birth, right? Which is mostly meaningless, but that's what we're looking at. Uh, that's how we compare these things. So, Hong Kong eats the most meat per capita of any population in the world, they have the longest average lifespan from birth, okay? Conveniently, things like the Blue Zone study and Eat Lancet and all that, just just ignore that, okay? Or just leave it out, all right? Um, and then, okay, these guys are living to their 90s. Well, they're not all living to their 90s. Again, their average is, you know, I think it's uh, 78 in Okinawa, around there, I think, um, Hong Kong is around 80. Anyway, it, but that's the highest. Um, so, you know, that's the average. People are living older than that, though. But they're saying they're living to their 90s. Okay, great. Um, we know as geneticists that the human animal is chromosomally, genetically designed to live 120 years. Okay, so 90 is dying young, actually. Okay, so you're doing something wrong. Okay. Now, maybe it's because you're eating plants, you're not eating meat, whatever it is, you're doing something. And again, Okinawa they eat a lot of meat, they eat a lot of pig, okay? Um, so, you know, that's not, you know, that's not really, you know, uh, a fair assessment, I don't think. Uh, you know, 
these people, you know, they're living longer as having a plant-based diet. I then want to ask you to think about a biomarker. And biomarkers we use, which not, doesn't necessarily change uh, mortality, but they, they are clues. And a plant-based diet is the only, and vegan diet is the only dietary pattern that consistently reduces and improves biomarkers associated with, with major disease states. We do know that a, a plant-based diet reduces traditional risk factors such as high sensitivity CRP, CRP L, L, LDLC, um, and high in, in, in whole grains, um, nuts and seeds lead to a re reduction in, in LDL blood pressure and also lipoprotein delay. Even with as much as four weeks we can on a vegan diet, we can see a reduction in, C, in CRP, LP little A, as powerful as taking as powerful as taking statin medications. Then when we think okay, so l l let's talk about that. Okay, so uh, you know he's talking he's talking about um, you know reduction of LDL cholesterol, LDLC is LDL cholesterol. Um, LDL cholesterol does not cause heart disease. Okay, all the big studies post two thousand fifteen have showed this conclusively. Okay, there's a meta analysis. So you have, you have you know control trials, randomized control trials, and you have a meta-analysis which looks at all those randomized control trials, looks at all the data, and sort of correlates it out statistically, and said, okay, what are we seeing here with this massive population and these, these, these you know massive group of people now? The large meta-analysis meta um, in the Journal of American College of Cardiology, published in 2021, so it was a recent study, okay, a meta-analysis showed uh, that saturated fat was not a cardiovascular risk. And instead, it was protective against stroke. Okay, so this goes against everything that we uh, are, have been taught in medical school. Certainly, that he was taught during his, uh, you know, residency in, in cardiology. So, you know, it, it's understandable that he's very much on the side of, you know, cholesterol is bad because we've been railing against cholesterol for sixty years. Okay, it just happens to be wrong. Um, more than so, the British Journal of Sports Medicine. Uh, they published a paper in the last few years showing that saturated fat, LDL cholesterol, is not a cause of heart, of heart disease. Um, it's actually an inflammatory process, like I mentioned before. Um, and in fact, there's an inverse relationship uh, between saturated fat intake and heart disease. Inverse. Okay, so it protects against heart disease. It also protects against Alzheimer's and, and Parkinson's and so forth because your brain's made out of fat and cholesterol and so forth. You need that to, to keep your brain healthy. Okay, you need it to, to, to develop healthily as well. So, kids, vitally important for them to get this evil saturated fat as well. Okay, um, there's a large study uh, with 60,000 patients, I think it was published in 2015, uh, looking at statins. You say, oh, this is better than statins at reducing cholesterol. We don't want to reduce cholesterol. Cholesterol is not the problem, okay? Statins have side effects, okay? They sap your cells of vitamin CoQ10. Anybody who prescribes statins you know, without prescribing vitamin CoQ10, I think is doing their patient a big disservice, okay? Uh, because that can actually damage your, your cells and can damage your heart cells, okay? So you're giving a medication to protect your heart and you're, you're now damaging your heart with that medication, okay? That's not great. So this looked at patients over the age of 65 is, you know, most common cohort for people that are at risk of heart disease and, 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 um, and heart attack. So they were on statins. 60,000 people, they found that there was a, that, that taking statins was at least neutral in their, um, you know, in their risk of getting a heart attack and stroke and so forth, or even worse. Okay, so people having statins having you know lower LDL cholesterol were actually having worse outcomes. Okay, so statistically, it was actually wasn't quite even, it was actually they were a little worse. Okay, so it's saying that like, look, we really need to rethink this because we're giving a medication that that is is not helping. It is definitely not helping, and it could be causing harm. And I would argue that it does cause harm because you're giving somebody something that has side effects and no benefit. Okay, so that's the definition of causing harm. Okay, the British, uh, you know, uh, the BMJ, the British Medical Journal, um, they did a literature review a few years ago as well. Again, found no association or actually an inverse association uh, between LDL cholesterol and all-cause mortality and cardiovascular um, mortality in the elderly, okay? So what are we doing? That, that's not a marker of disease. There was another study, another lit review in 2018 um, that showed, again, LDL cholesterol does not cause cardiovascular disease. 
Um, there's another study showing that uh, lower cholesterol level levels were linked to depression and suicide, okay? So people that had lower LDL cholesterol were having much higher rates of, of depression, and the ones who had depression and low cholesterol had a much higher rate of suicide, okay? That's a big deal, all right? So in fact, now psychiatrists who know this are now recommending their patients get your damn cholesterol up, okay? That's good. It's going to save your life and change your life, okay? Um, so, you know, this, this is all the new data. This is, this is very robust stuff. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of patients. We're talking about massive studies, meta-analyses, all these sorts of things, okay? But we almost don't need them, okay? Because all the studies that showed that cholesterol caused heart disease were bunk. There is no high-level evidence that actually shows that cholesterol is even associated with heart disease. No high-level evidence. None. And the evidence that we do have, we now know is bunk. We now know it's not only false, but fraudulent, okay? The Journal of American Medical Association published in 2015 actual internal memos from the sugar companies back in, you know, you know 40s, 50s, 60s, talking about how there were studies coming out that, that were suggesting that sugar caused heart disease. Now we, we you know, have actual hard evidence to suggest that it does, okay? So at the time, they were like, okay, well, you know, we need to put some you know, counter arguments out there. So in their own words, in their own documents, they detailed how they paid off three Harvard professors to falsify data and publish fraudulent studies to make it appear as if cholesterol was causing heart disease when it was really sugar. And one of those professors was named head of the USDA in 1965. And then the USDA is the, is, was the one that declared unequivocally that cholesterol causes heart disease, saturated fat increases cholesterol, stop eating both. It changed the world. People stopped eating fat, they stopped eating cholesterol, they stopped eating red meat especially, and, and eggs because all oh, these are the worst, they have the most cholesterol, actually they're the best. They have the most nutrients, that which, which cholesterol is one of, and so is saturated fat. What were the results? You know, we reduced our, our cholesterol intake by 30%, reduced red meat by 33%, increased fruits and vegetables by 30 and 40% respectively, increased, you know, um, sugars and grains as well. What happened? This is in America, hundreds of millions of people. What happened? The obesity rate tripled, stroke rate tripled, heart disease tripled, cancer rates tripled, type 2 diabetes, autoimmune disorders, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, even neurodevelopmental delays such as autism, these all increased exponentially. Okay, these almost didn't exist before, now they're the only things we treat. So you know, he's talking about, well, where's your, where's your evidence to say that a carnivore diet is going to uh, reduce these things? Dude, where's yours? You know, the, the, you know you, we reduced cholesterol by 30%. We reduced saturated, you know, saturated fat and, and red meat by 30, 33%. Okay, heart disease went up, heart disease tripled. Okay, so that is that is very conclusive, right? Well, maybe there's something else going on. Obviously, there's a lot of these things can go on, but when you run an experiment, especially with hundreds of millions of people, and you get these outcomes, you have to start thinking about it. Okay, as Richard Feynman said, you know, it doesn't matter how brilliant your theory is, and it doesn't matter how smart you are, if it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. Okay, so we did the experiment. It's wrong, okay? And we know that. We have, we have hard evidence showing that it's bullshit, okay? Ansel Keys did something called the seven, you know, seven Nation Study or something like that. And he found the nations that say, oh, the more cholesterol you have, the more heart disease you have. It was, it was this exponential growth, this exponential you know, chart, okay? Wow, that was very, that was very compelling. But that's a correlation. Correlation does not equal causation, okay? And he had complete data for like 23 countries. He only used the seven that fit the graph. If you look at the rest of the, of the, of the countries, if you plot those on the graph, it's just scattered. You know? So there isn't even a correlation. Okay? There isn't a correlation, let alone a causation. Okay? So there is no correlation between cholesterol and heart disease. Framingham study. Okay, there's a very famous study in cardiology. I think it was like 76,000 patients, followed them for like 20 years, and they're like, okay, what, what sort of markers, these biomarkers that he's talking about, what, which ones are significant? And they concluded that cholesterol, total cholesterol, before we distinguish them, total cholesterol being higher was an increased risk for heart disease and cardiovascular disease, okay? The only problem with that is their own results and findings showed the opposite. 
Okay, but they, you know, and you can find this and they say like, well, you know, we did find this and this, that and the other. However, we still feel that, you know, cholesterol is, is, a, is a significant uh, risk factor. Okay, that's fraud. That, that is, you know, academic malpractice. Okay, but that went out and you, you get these things and you repeat them so many times that people just, oh, well, that's what it is. Everyone knows it. Well, again, everyone knew that the earth was flat too. How'd that one work out, right? Oh, and the seeds too. I mean, okay, you. who cares if you're, we don't care that we're reducing LDL cholesterol, but you know, it does one thing. Let's say that you wanted it to do reduce the LDL cholesterol. Okay, but you gotta understand this is a complex, you know, organic, you know, these are complex organic compounds you're putting in your body and there's tens of thousands of them. You know, what do those ones do? What do the rest of them do? Okay, because I mean, there's cyanide in almonds, okay? You know, one to two pounds of almonds in a day will kill you. Okay, you know, inside the peach pit, it looks like a little shriveled up almond. It's called, it's called a, um, um, what is it called? Bitter almond. Okay, one or two of those will kill you with the amount of cyanide that's in there. Okay, so you know, a seed is a plant's baby. Okay, all organisms protect their babies more than anything. A seed is a plant's baby. That's generally where you find the highest concentration of toxic elements. Okay, so you're eating a bunch of seeds to lower your cholesterol which you don't want to do, and you're bringing in all this other crap. Again, it's cherry picking, okay? So you're, you're saying you have this one beneficial thing, okay, what else is in there? What are the other 100,000 things that are that are in, in an almond? What do those ones do for you? Okay, are they all good or at least neutral? So this one good thing just sort of tips you over the balance, you know? The answer to that riddle is no, okay? Then we'll go on. Think about more novel risk factors, and my teammate um, Jason's going to talk about the microbiome. But I want to talk about trimethylamine and inoxide, which is produ produced by the gut in response to choline consumption. Choline comes from red red meat, eggs, and dairy. And the more TMAO we, we produce in our, in our in our guts as a byproduct of, of these foods, the higher the risk for cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, obesity, and my and myocardial infarction. And what's fascinating is if if you vegans do not produce TMAO in, in the gastro in the gastrointestinal tracts, and we this is research has come out of the Cleveland Clinic and it's been re, re, reproduced in in multiple multiple studies on both high risk and, and low risk risk patient groups. Then we have to start thinking. Okay, that's a better argument. All right, you know, talking about TMAO, TMAO and so forth. Fine. Yeah, you know, I, I have no problem with that. The problem, the problem um, comes because these, these studies look at meat eaters, not carnivores. Okay, so you know, he asked us, where's the carnivore study that shows that a carnivore diet shows improvement in these sorts of things? Okay, where's your study that shows a carnivore diet causes harm? Because we don't have those studies either. Okay, we look at meat eaters. We look at people that have meat in their diet. Okay, and this is again problematic with these with these epidemiological studies and these confounding factors, because you know we've been told for the last you know 40, 50 years that eating meat will, it will kill you, especially red meat will kill you, and so you know you have, you have a certain population who then says you know what I'm going to do this because I enjoy it and I want to do it, so screw it, I only have one life. Well, a lot of people with that mentality also smoke, drink. You know, you know, do extreme sports and all these sorts of things. They're more likely to die in a car a car accident. They're more likely to speed. They're more likely to do different things that are that are dangerous because they say, "Screw it! I've only got one life. I'm going to enjoy it." And you know, red meat got put into that category of something that's super bad for you. And they're like, "Ah, screw it!" So you have these people that that is a confounding factor, and that is something that has to be accounted for. Okay, so when they control for those things. You know that you know meat eaters are more likely to smoke. They're more likely to drink. They're more likely to do all these sorts of things. When you control for that and you and you sort of uh, correct for that, you actually don't find an association with any of this crap. Okay, so again, where's the study that shows that carnivorism caused problem? Not meat eating with all this other crap going on, but carnivorism. And okay, so and and so for the microbiome. Your microbiome is going to be very, very different depending on what you eat. It changes basically daily, okay? Because your your what you eat feeds your your gut biome, okay? And so if you eat different things, you're going to have a different gut biome, okay? So it depends on what bacteria you have. You have specific bacteria that will break down specific things into specific byproducts, okay? So if you have specific bacteria, that you know may turn you know these these um, you know choline into 
uh, you know, uh, a TMAO. Okay, maybe, all right. Are you gonna have that gut bacteria if you're on a carnivore diet? Do that study, where's your study showing that, okay? Um, probably not, honestly, I don't know, because we don't have a study, but we don't know. It doesn't matter though, because if you're just eating a carnivore diet, you're not eating fiber. Fiber delays the absorption, actually blocks and stops the absorption and breakdown of the food that you eat. This was the argument, this is the entire argument in the 80s on why you should eat fiber because it, it stops you from absorbing calories. It has no nutrition, it feels like you're full, and it blocks your body's ability to absorb food. How would that arise in nature, that that's like a good thing for survival and starvation? I mean, that doesn't make any damn sense. But that was the argument. I mean, it was all oh, fat busters, gotta lose weight, lose weight, lose weight, all these sorts of things. Um, okay. But what are you doing? You're stuck. You have this, these big tangles of fiber that you, you cannot break down. No vertebrate animal can break these down. It's actually special bacteria in the guts of things like, you know, of herbivores that can break this stuff down. Okay, we don't have those. Okay, there's some, you can get some of those in your large intestine. They don't exist before that. Um, so you get these big tangles, okay? And, you know, these food particles are stuck in these tangles. Enzymes can't get to it. And they can't get to the, you know, the, this, um, you know, the, the borders of your, of your small intestine, the lumen of your intestine and so forth. So they can't get absorbed. Okay. So these get taken into the large intestine where the bacteria are, and these then, you know, cause these problems. So if you're not eating fiber, your body's going to absorb all this stuff. Very little of that is going to get, if any, is going to get to your large intestine. We know this because we've studied this with people. Uh, with stomas, you know, you, you remove part of your intestine, you have this bag, this fecal matter comes, comes out of, in the bag. And we look at this, when people are not eating fiber, and they're eating, you know, animal protein and so forth, almost none of it comes out, okay? But when you're eating plant proteins, a lot of it comes out. This is how we know about bioavailability of, of you know, meat-based proteins versus plant-based proteins, okay? That's, that's part of, you know, why we know that plant-based proteins don't have a very high bioavailability, and that meat does okay so if you're not eating fiber you know and you're not eating plants at all you may not even have the right bacteria that will turn this stuff into tmao okay but either way you're not eating fiber so you know the majority of what you're eating is going to get absorbed so it's not even going to get to the large intestine to be introduced to the bacteria which may not even exist anyway okay so there's that thinking about outcomes because it's fine to reduce it, think about what we see, then it's fine to think about biomarkers, but how can we show a plant-based diet can reduce both cardiovascular event rates and, and malignancy? And these are the only dietary pattern that has shown to reduce uh, obesity. And we do know, uh, some people think they can lose a lot of weight on a ketogenic or, or can't carnivore diet, and perhaps some people do. So you'll have a thinner coffin when you die, and you'll, you'll, be, there, you'll, be, there, you'll be there sooner. Um, okay, so I mean, he literally just contradicted himself. Okay, he's saying that there's there's no stu there's no diet that you know shows that you can get weight loss. You know, except a vegan diet. Oh, I mean, I guess you could with with keto, but uh, you're just gonna die. Okay, well, d does it make you lose weight or doesn't it? Okay, and again, you know, what vegan diet? What kind of vegan diet are you doing? The Oreo cookie cookie and heroin diet? That's vegan. Meth is vegan. Okay. Just means no meat, right? Rocks are vegan, okay? So, you know, you know, define your terms here, you know? Just any old vegan diet? No, obviously not, we know that. You know, but then you're saying, like, oh, nothing else has been shown to do this except for vegan diet, oh, except for all these other things too, but ah, you don't want those, okay? Well, you know, you're not really helping your own argument here. Um, we know that, that vegan diets significantly improve dyslipidemia. We know that they reduce hypertension. We think Again, who gives a shit about, about dyslipidemia? Who cares about your cholesterol when you're not eating sugar, you're not eating, uh, you're not drinking alcohol, and you're not eating a bunch of carbohydrates to jack up uh, your blood sugar, okay? You know, if you're, if you're one of these people that are, you know, you know, drinking alcohol, eating sugar, eating carbohydrates, and so forth, you know, a statin might help you. You know, because you, you do have, you know, uh, you know, this disease process, this inflammatory process that's going on. Okay. You know, maybe that'll help. That would be an interesting study if you distinguish out those sorts of things. Okay. Um, 
But yeah, otherwise, I really don't care about cholesterol as a doctor and as a patient. Like, I just don't care. We think about one of the most common causes of, of stroke and heart failure in the Western world. It's, uh, it's, it's hypertension. We know that a vegan diet predictably you know, improves, improves diabetes and, and, also, and, also heart, and also heart failure. Okay, so one of the most, um, con- you know, one of, one of the, the, the diets that we have the most uh, data on and conclusive evidence on for helping diabetes actually is the ketogenic diet. We've been using that for well over 100 years, and we've been using it in the 1800s to stabilize uh, diabetics, uh, blood sugar, and so forth. Okay, so there, there is just a ton of evidence, you know, showing that a ketogenic diet, like if you're diabetic, especially type 2 diabetic, type 1 as well. You really don't want to eat carbohydrates. You really don't want to eat sugar, you know. So that that is very important for that. So, and again, you know, Oreo cookies, not not going to be good for a diabetic. Hypertension, sure, hypertension is is, is a killer. But you know, I, I, you know, we we have no study showing that a carnivore diet increases your blood pressure, none. Okay, and I have. Dozens of patients right now on a, on a carnivore diet. I've spoken to hundreds of people over the past few thousands, really. And there's you know people in, in you know carnivore groups and chat groups, things like that, where we talk about these sorts of things. You know, you know, Rivero Health is a really good one for that. There's different Facebook groups as well. Um, you know, Dr. Baker has 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 helped tons of people. We're not seeing blood pressure be an issue. In fact, we're seeing people get off their blood pressure medication. My my father has had you know intractable blood pressure problems for you know for yonks. He doesn't anymore. That's very stable now. You know, I've been eating this way for, you know, I've always been heavy meat eater. And I've basically been a pure, well, always basically been a pure carnivore. I eat everything else by sufferance. But, you know, for about the last 20 years, I was really full on for a solid five years and then sort of slipped off. I was eating little bits and pieces of things here and there. And then for the last, you know, five, six years, absolutely not anything besides meat, salt, water. Okay. I don't have any blood pressure issues. Okay, and you know my patients don't have blood pressure issues on a carnivore diet either. Okay, and I've I've never heard of that. I've never heard of of someone going carnivore and having a blood pressure issue. Um, s- simple reason why, physiologically, humans are carnivores. That's the kind of animal we are. That's how we develop. That's how we evolve. So you know you know you go to first principles. We're not going to have these disease state processes if you are eating naturally. You know. You know, elderly lions don't, you know, probably don't have a bunch of blood pressure issues if they're just, you know, still eating meat. Okay, it, that that's an abnormal pathology that comes about when eating the wrong thing. Yeah. There are multiple studies published in literature, in large peer-reviewed lit- literature, especially in study in journals like the Journal of American Cardi. Um, cardiology journal which shows the more serving of animal foods you have the greater the chance of heart disease with a follow-up of 4.8 million million person years and one of the most important studies is that for every cat when even if we replace a small amount of animal protein with plant protein we can show a significant reduction not only in cardiovascular disease but cancer you know it's no point treating everyone with heart disease only for them to die of cancer many 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 years later Okay, again, so you, you get these, these associations, you know, you know, correlation is not causation, you know, and again, these, these epidemiological studies are saying that like, you know, this, um, you know, meat eaters, what does that mean? That does not mean carnivores. That means someone who eats meat and also smokes and drinks and drives too fast. Okay, but I don't know which ones he's quoting there. They've, they've done tons of these over the decades, but the recent ones corrected and controlled for those sorts of things. They didn't even find an association with eating meat and these poor outcomes, okay? Um, so, you know, again, like, you know, and, and you know, I, I don't know what, what study he's referring to where re- you're replacing some, you know, animal protein with, with, you know, with plant protein and that improves some things somehow. I'd have to take a look at the study and have to know what he's talking about there. But um, it sounds pretty suspect, honestly, because it, it doesn't make any damn sense. You know, if that's the only thing that you're changing in that system. And again, this is going to be a system eating, you know, the sad diet, you know, standard Australian diet, standard American diet, things like that with a bunch of other crap in it. 
okay? So it's not the meat that's doing this. Show me a single study showing, me, showing that you've controlled for everything else except for meat. And meat is the problem. Show me one study that says that. There are none. And we do know that people that adopted a plant-based diet had significantly reduced reduced malignancy rates. Um, so 30 I'd seconds, like, Jason. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. So I'd like to sum up that a, a, vegan, a vegan diet is, one, is the only dietary pattern that in a Western society has shown a reduction in, the main, in, in both the incidence and allows us treatment for the major diseases that afflict Western society and is sustainable for our for our planet, for, for, for our population, and for our patients to follow. Okay, so sustainable for the planet, that is absolutely incorrect. Um, when you grow a, a crop, you necessarily have to destroy an entire ecosystem. You have to just, you have to bulldoze and destroy all the plants, kill all the plants, kill all the animals, rip up the ground, till it up, and then, you know, plant your crops, okay? And crops, well, just any plant in general, they take nutrients, they get their nutrients from their soil, right? What puts the, the nutrients back in? Animals. So when you're having an ecosystem, you have plants and animals living in symbiosis where you know, the, they each nourish eat, and help each other, okay? So you know, animals will be eating the plants and then they'll, their, their excretions and so forth will then replace those nutrients back into the soil, okay? And that is what, is what, nourishes, is that what replenishes the nutrients in the soil, okay? And that's what keeps plants growing again. Um, tons of people have done this. Um, Alan Savory, who's out in Zimbabwe, has been doing this for 40 years or something like that, taking large herds of animals, moving them through deserts, moving through mines, like strip mines and things like that. And actually, because those animals are there, all of a sudden these things are able to, you know, regrow the soil, re um, you know, re-nourish the soil. And they, all of a sudden they're growing just massive, massive, massive amounts of, of vegetation and so forth. Forests are coming back, you know, then new animals will come back through, you know, and start migrating there and so forth. Um, it, it massive changes. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Peter Ballerstedt, um, who's a very interesting guy, you should look up his stuff. Uh, I'll try to put some, some links to these guys in the, uh, in the description. Uh, but, you know, he's a PhD in forage agronomy. I've, I've spoken to him, you know, just personally. I was very interested in his work, so I emailed him and we ended up having a you know, discussion over Zoom. Very interesting guy, very bright guy, really shows the science behind how important animals are to the environment. Think about it this way. During the Dust Bowl in America during the 1930s, um, you know, no one could grow anything. You had dust storms, all these sorts of things. Everything was horrible. We've then figured, and it, it was turning into a desert. It was turning into like the, the Sahara Desert, right? Um, which is man-made, by the way. Look it up. And we figured this out. This was actually the farming techniques, Okay, um, and we realized that you know this is when you, you're tilling this soil, you're making large rows of this stuff. It rains, it washes all the topsoil away. Wind hits it, picks it up, blows it all away. Okay, so you're losing all these topsoil, all this topsoil. We're able to change things around to mitigate that, but we still lose billions of tons a year. In 2017, we lost 27.5 billion tons of topsoil. Okay, that's an area the size of Kentucky. Okay, which is the size of you know a European country. Okay, so. You know, that, that's a finite resource as well. You know, it takes, you know, uh, 500 years to grow a centimeter of topsoil. Okay, that is going to run out a lot quicker than we've realized, okay? And so, you know, that's a big problem. And, you know, where do these fertilizers come from for crops? They come from animals. They come from livestock, okay? They come from their manure. You know, they talk about, they talk about you know, animals, you know, uh, well, they, if, we, if we just weren't growing all this, you know, like, you know, corn and things like that for, you know, animal feed and stuff like that. You know, we, we'd have more than enough food and blah, 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 blah. That's nonsense. The, the feed that they give to, to animals is like hay. How much hay do you want to eat exactly? Okay. They're eating the parts of the plants that we cannot eat, that we cannot digest. 92% of the, feed, of the, the crops grown for, um, for animals, for livestock, is inedible by humans. It's the leavings, it's the waste, okay? So it's like, you know, the shaft of the wheat and things like that. We can't eat that. That's given to cows, okay? And they eat that, their manure replenishes the soil, okay? So this is nonsense. And, you know, helping the, and like, that is just nonsense, you know? So I, I can go into that and other things, but watch 
Peter Ballerstedt watched Alan Savory. He did, he did a, um, several YouTube talks and he had a, had a TED talk as well. Quickly about you know the Sahara Desert. That actually wasn't a desert several thousand years ago, okay, before the agricultural revolution. That's what changed things. In my opinion, I, I think that anyway, I think the evidence is there. You know, the, the, um, the pyramids and, and sphinx, we had sam soil samples done in the 1990s that actually looked and found that, you know, they were like, oh, was these always desert people? They found, no, actually, these were, these were built in jungles. These were jungle people. These were jungle pyramids. Okay. But they had widespread farming that sort of grew around that time and, you know, you know, in the BC era and it, it turned things to desert because they didn't figure it out. You had the Nile river, which flooded every year and the silt would replenish the nutrients. We learned this as kids and we don't think past that, but what does that mean? That means that it, the nutrients needed to be replenished every single year where all the places that didn't have a Nile river, they didn't get replenished. They couldn't grow things after that turn to deserts. We have um, satellite images, infrared satellite images that actually showed that there's like human, you know, human habitation sort of like all across what is now the Sahara Desert, you know, like, you know, structures and things like that, you know, like the, the, the you know, the bones of a, of a structure and civilizations and things like that. That was not a uh, desert, okay? These things were made by agriculture, by crops, okay? Not animals. The animals are what kept these things alive, okay? And that's what keeps the environment and the ecosystem alive. Okay, so I think that's, that's probably enough for that one. Sorry that I had a lot to say about that. Uh, I'll do the I'll do the other um, the other participants as well because I think there's, there's definitely things to address there uh, in other videos. Um, this one was mostly surrounded by um, you know w w with the cholesterol debate, and I think that that's something that's very very important because that's central to this discussion uh, on plant based versus you know meat diets and carnivore vegan and and so forth being the extremes of that. But it's something that's very very important. It's something I have I have patients and and you know friends and colleagues going, oh, well, what about cholesterol? What about cholesterol? What about cholesterol? Okay, so you look like you're in good shape. You know, you look like you're healthy and all your bloods and everything like that show you're very, very, very healthy. But what's your cholesterol doing? I'll tell you what my cholesterol is doing. I don't give a damn. I know what my cholesterol is, but I don't give a damn. Okay, it's actually basically normal, but I don't give a damn. If it's high, it's physiological. Whatever it is, it's physiological because I'm eating in an evolutionary, biological, species-specific way. And so whatever my cholesterol is, whatever my bloods are doing, they're supposed to be doing that. You know, we have these blood markers and these, these studies and these standardized tests that we use that are predicated on lies, okay? So we need to rethink these and we need to get different reference ranges and so forth to, to tell us what's actually healthy and what's not, okay? All right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I'll be doing further videos uh, every week. I'll probably do a little more than that as well sometimes. I'm starting a podcast as well with a friend of mine, uh, Simon Lewis, uh, called How to Carnivore with the Plant Free MD. That's me. No plants. Um, and I'll do more of these uh, rebuttal sort of videos as well. I'm sure they'd like to do it for me. I think that would be great. I would love to have a conversation with these guys, you know, one on one, maybe even over uh, video on uh, on uh, podcast and because I'm sure they had I mean things that I said and that we said I'm sure they had tons of things that they wanted to say about that and that's how you that's how you work this out you both talk back and forth you say well you said this however I seen this study and looked at this what about this and they say the same thing back to you and you have a discussion and I think that that's a very healthy thing to do I think that's really the best way to to come to you know some sort of conclusion it, you know maybe not maybe you guys you know what i'm walking away saying you're going to agree to disagree but you know other people can take away a lot from that and hopefully we can set that up in the future all right guys if you can like and subscribe and share this with people that would really help i'm just getting the channel started and and you know obviously that that uh, is helpful when you do that so uh click the little bell and you'll see more of my stuff thanks guys